Um, thank you very much. I send all of you the virtual and the, the physical applause. Thank you, Ellen and Nell and Jiwan. Um, thanks for your inspiring uh, talks and you know, sharing a little bit about what you and your students are, are doing. Um, as I reflect on this panel, uh, I think one of the, the themes that shows up is you, we have some complex measurement challenges that are complex in different ways for different reasons. Uh, so maybe I can kick off a, a little bit of a discussion, and I'll, I'll go to Ellen first, um, just because you know, that was sort of the order we went in here. But you know, if you look at the kinds of sensors um, or the, the constraints of bringing together both the technology and the people that we need to collect these data on, you know, what are some of the sensors that, that in challenges that you have to collect the data that would be informing uh, the direction uh, of your research? Sure, yeah, um, it's a great question. So for, for these patients um, that I mentioned in, in the talk, these single ventricle physiology patients, um, what's useful for us to collect are, are breathing, um, timing of breathing, chest expansion, um, for example, and then flow in the uh, inferior vena cava. So they have unique um, design requirements. So for, for the breathing, potentially a wearable sensor would be ideal. And uh, in this study, and um, for example, we needed to be MRI compatible. Uh, for the flow sensor, ideally we would want something that's implantable. So these patients have a surgical shunt implanted and if we could measure flow in that shunt with an implantable uh, biocompatible sensor and use that to um, monitor, but also potentially trigger some of our assistive devices, that would be ideal. Uh, so MRI compatibility, wearability and biocompatibility. Um, and ideally wireless uh, data collection and uh, um, transcutaneous energy transfer for powering it as well. Good, thank you. Um, Jiwan, I was wondering, you know, just in terms of the, the type of, there's the, the, the demonstration that your postdocs and your students can do, uh, but, but how much data do you need? How many people do you need to enroll? What's, what's the sort of the, the data collection look like, the complexity of, of being able to evaluate the technology on not just one individual or two individuals, but tens and twenties and thirties. Is that something that is a going to be an easy path or that's, is that a roadblock or how, how do you sort of manage that interface? Oh, you mean the uh, human subject for, for, for the research that I presented today? Huh? How many human subjects were, were um, um, used for, for that? Is that the, 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 the challenges of interfacing with with the human in developing that tech, testing it, collecting the data, and not just um, yeah that that human oh, and technology. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that thing, yes, yes, yes. So, so you know, uh, the biggest challenge is like I mentioned in my talk, you know, um, imperceptibilities, meaning that when you wear the uh, you know e skin. You know, you do not want to feel it. You really want to collect the data while you don't feel anything. But the biggest challenge when when the you know a human subject wear this is the uh, you know the wireless communication. So so all the chips and skin patches can be thin and conformable, you know, on the skin. But you know, wireless communication system is really 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 bulky. That has been a big problem. So so that is the. Uh, one of the most challenging to for this technology to go onto market. So, so that that you know, what is communication challenge? Second, um, still the skin patches is mechanically weak. So if you wear this couple of times, it will it will be you know torn apart. So you really have to work on the mechanical stability of this this you know skin patches. But if if it's too strong, then you feel something on on, on your skin, and uh, you know if it's too strong. It's really hard to make a good interface between the electronics and human skin. So uh, that is some sort of like, uh, you know, um, um, trade-off space. So you have to wear it without feeling anything. At the same time, you need to have a mechanical stability. So then, you know, you can keep wearing this. So in other words, it's a price. So the electronic component, thin electronic component on your skin can be cheap. But if you have to throw this away by wearing a couple of, couple of times, then, you know, that's going to be the problematic. So these two things are the, you know, uh, uh, immediate challenge we see, then we really have to solve this problem in the future. 
Okay, very good. Thank you. And, and, and Neville, I mean, you, I think you made the comment that the the data was rather um, easy to collect. I, I think you said the statement, but you know, I I think that was in the con in a particular context, a laboratory context, or you know how, how, the types of data that you need. Is it something that needs to be to really be impactful acquired in the, under the context of daily living? Um, you know, what's the environment and the complexity of the, the data that you would need to further understand human movement and human dynamics and human motor behavior? So I think that the important thing is, at least for the applications I envision, is I'd like to have this happening either in a clinician's office or maybe even at home. And I think that the, the core data, while, while, I mean, what we would like to have is kinematic data and force data. Kinematic data, I think, can be obtained from a computer, from a, a, a Video camera. In fact, I, in fact, I think we may even be able to get sufficient accuracy just by using a cell phone camera. That may that may require a, a, a bit of software, but with neural net approaches, we're able to extract whole body kinematics with reasonable precision. The, the real question is, okay, well, we can get that data, but what do you do with it? And I think the uh, the tr traditional way to measure things like balance dynamics have been to apply perturbations, look like responses. But as I, as I pointed out in the presentation, that's great, but you've changed the thing that you're trying to, you're trying to measure. So we need to have non-perturbing measurements and that implies something like cell phone camera. There's also force-based uh, uh, measurements and those I think, uh, a force plate in principle can be relatively cheap, but you could make one essentially kind of like a bathroom scales only with a little bit of extra uh, smarts in it. That could be something that could be uh, in, again in, in a clinician's office. So it doesn't have to be a, a, an elaborate uh, setup. So, so building on that a little bit, in the keynote this morning, um, Dr. Stupas challenged us to think about how we engage the the practicing clinician that's outside of the the environment that we have in Boston. The the urban environment uh, is unique. The rural environment has the the larger population. It's potentially more challenging to permeate in, in, in engaging in research. Um, so it's, maybe this is a vague question, but you, can you imagine um, in each of your collective research threads, um, what might be unique opportunities in the trade-off between the a high resolution, high fidelity type sensing environment that you could get with a clinician that's in a teaching hospital um, in Boston versus engaging with the, the more rural clinic um, are there unique opportunities there for technology development? Uh, are the unique opportunities that would actually give you better data and better information for, uh, over a larger population set to, to really uh, address some of the things that you would like to know? So my question, uh, back to you, back to you is, yeah, uh, we can start with you, Noah. Go ahead. So does your does your clinician have uh, a laptop with a, with with a camera, and do they have? access to the internet? Because that's yes. the only Yeah. So Neville, sorry. So the, yes, the, the clinician would be a, a, connected to the internet and have a, a basically lap, laptops and yeah, but you know, but it's not a, okay. they're not necessarily doing research, but they're seeing their active work of seeing, of seeing patients. But is there an easy way that you can imagine sort of engaging with them in a, in a different way than you would engage with hospitals and doctors in the greater Boston area. So I, I guess what I was driving at is that the core, the core data acquisition for the things that we're doing, I, I believe can come from a camera. The computational uh, resources may be pretty hefty, but those are available in, in the cloud. So you might be able to just get camera data, ship it off to the cloud. I don't know which, which version you'd use. You might have to wait a little, but then you wind, wind up uh, with clinically interpretable data back. And I think that latter part's really important. You, you, you can't expect your clinician to have a degree in, in mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. They, 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 you got to talk to them in clinical terms, but that can be done. Do you want or Ellen, you know, what, what do you see as the, you know, it might be, uh, so it's a different framing for each of you, but you know, how do you engage with the, 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 more, the broader base of of clinicians that are seeing the broader base of our, our population that are outside of the, the, the city medical centers. Yeah, are you I going try to, to uh, reach out. So whenever we have we found something interesting, 
that has the, uh, you know, um, um, some interesting application for medical field, you know, we, I just searched <laughs> through the Google and, and try to reach out to the people there. So we had a discussion and we designed the experiment together, you know, um, that is so far, that is the uh, way for, for at least my group to communicate with the uh, clinicians in the, in the city. And, you know, recent example would be like, uh, we um, had a discussion with uh, the dermatologist in MGH. I approached them first and, 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 and we try to find the problem together. That's quite uh, useful and interesting. And maybe Alan has a much more exposure to this kind of environment. Yeah, I mean, I think for my research, um, we look at devices mainly. So there's an opportunity if you're implanting a device to integrate sensing into that device. And maybe the patient comes to the center of excellence to have the device implanted, but then there's an opportunity to monitor long-term in their own home. So if you can instrument a device with a sensor, then the physician or the healthcare team can check in on how that patient is doing longitudinally. Um, I also think that there's an opportunity to develop um, very accessible wearable sensors for, for people um, that, you know, again, um, their physician can, can monitor them or, you know, the data can be uploaded somewhere where they can check in on them um, even virtually. Uh, so as well as having their virtual checkup, they can maybe check um, their vital signs and things from, from uh, wearable sensors. Good, thank you. I'm going to start to take some questions here from the audience. Um, this one in particular was directed at, at uh, Dr. Hogan. Uh, would you expect the center of mass versus frequency profiles in different populations of subjects um, to be different? You know, the example here, trained gymnasts versus normal versus elderly, uh, and how would one train to reduce this noise? Let me try to answer that. that, that, that so there's a great question and there's, a, there's about a th three or four hour answer to it, but let me keep it, give you the short version. Uh, uh, first of all, we, we would expect, in fact, we know that that profile is different for different, uh, um, for, for different subjects. This is work in collaboration with uh, Craig Rubin at the University of Wisconsin, and he's been studying stroke patients. In fact, our initial data that I presented was his, was his, data, his data on unimpaired subjects. He's shown that the paretic limb of stroke patients gives you a substantially different uh, frequency uh, profile of inter intersection point versus frequency. And um, as to whether you can train this, on, oh, as to train gymnasts, my colleague Dagmar Sternert at Northeastern has studied trained gymnasts, but I have no idea how we'll be able to deal with, with, with those data. That, that those people are pretty good, so it's not obvious how we can tease much, it, it, it's not clear that we can distinguish them with, with this crude measurement. How do you train people to improve balance? I think that's it, that's very tricky. What we've talked about here is how to measure balance. But I think when you go to trying to train people to improve balance, then we need to actually be able to interact with them, preferably physically, be adding some touch and physical contact to the, uh, to the interaction. Uh, how to do that over the internet, that's not impossible, but it's not yet available widely. Thank you. I think this, this question is directed at, at uh, Dr. Roche. Um, what kind of impact can a non-invasive or an invasive invent, intervention make to patients with single, ventri single ventricle disease? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, both can have an impact and some of the work I presented um, suggests that potentially um, training these patients with single ventricle physiology on how they breathe and breathing interventions um, could present um, an option for non-invasive intervention and improve their hemodynamics, their um, venous return to the lungs, and as a result of that, um, alleviate some of the deleterious downstream effects that arise from, from pressure overload of the, on the venous side. Um, so that would be on the non-invasive side, and that's the subject of ongoing work that we're doing in collaboration with the Boston Children's Hospital to really see if we can come up with a a program or a, a, an exercise, um, breathing, breathing based exercise to alleviate some of these symptoms. On the interventional side, given that they already undergo multiple surgeries, three surgeries by the age of five, 
um, there is an opportunity there that we could implant an active device. So instead of a passive shunt that's surgically implanted at the moment, we could potentially um, place an active device that actually helps um, with increasing forward flow to the lungs and preventing retrograde flow back to the abdominal organs. And that would have the potential to alleviate symptoms. If that can be tunable um, as the patient grows, and if we can have integrated sensing to monitor how the flow is doing, I think we can really uh, make a big difference to the, the quality of life of these patients who are now surviving into their 30s and 40s. Um, so, so I think there's a big, um, a big room there to make some uh, impact in these patients' lives. Thank you. Uh, this this question is uh, directed at Dr. Kim. Um, the question, if I paraphrase, is uh, if you look at the some of the things that you demonstrated for measurement, you had pulse and aspects of sweat. Where do, where do you see the the biggest opportunity for something that is can't be done in any other way? Is it the long-term wearableness? Is it a unique uh, biomarker? Where's the biggest um, bang for the buck as this, as this text came in? So, so actually, this, this research was funded by the uh, cosmetic company called Amore Pacific in South Korea. So, so we actually developed this with a targeted application for monitoring the uh, skin condition wherever you go continuously. So, so and actually in the lab of the, uh, you know, uh, cosmetic company try to understand human skin, uh, just intermittently, you know, measure the skin activities. So, so it's not continuous measurement. So, so uh, it's really hard to track the, uh, you know, skin condition with different parameters like, uh, you know, um, uh, moisture level and the UV exposure levels and, and um, um, uh, strain on the skin. That has to be, um, uh, the data has to be continuously collected to precisely measure the skin condition so that they can uh, actually um, develop the uh, right cosmetics for, for specific for different types of skin condition. So it's really important to, to catalyze the skin condition. So for that, th this device was designed originally, but you know, in the field of in the medical, um, you know, uh, we, we actually envision that if we can um, build the chips, like a conventional chips on the skin patches, we can treat the, uh, you know, uh, the disease. For example, like uh, uh, one thing that we are working on right now is sort of like uh, we try to put some LED and photo detector, you know, arrays of LEDs and photo detector uh, uh, embedded onto that, you know, straight inspired skin patches so that we can actually treat the you know, skin cancers. We can actually do the light therapy right on top of your skin. You don't have to go inside the room to, to treat your cancer. We just put the LEDs, small LEDs right on your skin. Then we can monitor the size of the cancer cells by integrating the photo detectors, arrays of photo detectors. You can actually, you know, know the size of the skin cancer. So we can, you know, actually enhance or reduce the strength intensity of the, you know, uh, LED light to, 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 to treat the cancer. That's a one example. So we can try like a interface with any types of medical device with a human skin with actual device right on top of your, your body, right on top of your skin. That is kind of like the application space in the future. Um, so I'm going to go round robin now with a, with a few questions in the time that we have remaining. Um, what so experience is what we get? I think it's said uh, when you uh, get something you didn't expect. Um, so what in your collective research? You know, what is the what are the, some of the most surprising lessons that you learned? Uh, whether you got something you didn't expect or you or vice versa. Um, we'll, we'll go around the room. Start with Ellen. Um. Pertaining to the project I, I discussed, I think um, we had pr prior work where we were assisting the heart and we thought that um, assisting the, um, the, the single ventricle physiology in a similar way would, would um, be favorable. Um, we learned, in fact, um, by building high fidelity kind of benchtop models that the same approach may be um, non-favorable or actually make the, the hemodynamics worse um, given the 
the pressures and this reconstructed, like the surgical reconstruction of the heart. So we really had to go back and, um, and look at simulating the entire um, situation uh, in a lot more, um, with, with a lot more fidelity, um, specifically the effect of the respiratory mechanics and how they affected the, the flow in these patients, because really um, the return to the lungs of these patients is completely governed by respiration and not by, by heartbeat. So we really had to rethink our strategy there. And in doing so, I think we learned a lot more about the mechanics of the, of the physiology and also led us to looking at these non-invasive interventions by using breathing to actually um, help with the flow. So um, this was unexpected when we started this project, but has led to um, new insights that we think we can, um, we can use further to, to guide therapeutic intervention. Thank you. Uh, G1, what are some surprises you've seen along the way here? Yes, along the way, so which actually, like I presented in my talk, you know, uh, we try to utilize the conventional electronics that used to be on the wafer, rigid wafer, so integrated circuit. We try to utilize a gallium nitride-based uh, integrated circuit for, 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 for human. For, for human skin. So for example, you know, GAN electronics has been used for the communication chips. So, so you can easily find the gallium nitride in your cell phone that is kind of like, a, you know, the communication chip. So it has you know, 5G, you know, filter inside your cell phone. So gallium nitride is being used for the communication, you know, so broad communication. So which has not been imagined to be used for human beings. So we try to, you know, find the application space of this, you know, our, our technology, because we know how to integrate the, uh, you know, conventional electric chips on, on human body. So we try to utilize this communication skill of this gallium nitride device for a human being. That way you're able to develop the way to, you know, communicate this device, this device on the human skin with the computer without having any computer wireless chips or or any battery meaning that we use you know communication device on the skin so that device can that device enable us to have the batteryless chipless communication of the uh, you know uh, uh, our our e skin with with outside the computer in other words you can you know monitor the physiologic activity without having any chips any battery so, so that is kind of quite surprising result that we have seen during this development. Thank you, Jiwon. And then uh, Neville, um, what have you been surprised about as you've sort of explored this, this space of, of measuring human motor behavior? <laughs> Short answer is everything so far. But let, let me get more specific. My main interest is really in understanding, not just measuring human motor behavior, but understanding the control of human motor behavior and the control of robots and how they can interact productively. And one of the things that's been a surprise recently is that we've developed a, a method of robot control that's essentially a, a, a crude mimic of what we think is the way that the biological controller works. And we were expecting it to be okay, but not do as well as the conventional computationally intensive um, uh, methods of robot control. To our surprise, we found that if you have a sufficiently complex robot, the biologically motivated version, although it should be worse, is actually better. And that was a, a, quite a surprise. And we think that that's, that's something we need to understand better, but it, it, it has to do with the fact that the biological system is very complex and the complexity actually can be an advantage, not a disadvantage. Excellent. And again, what we, we learn by the things we don't expect and figure out the answers. So th thank you, everybody. The wonderful discussion, wonderful presentations. Uh, Professors Roche, Hogan, and Kim, thank you. Again, virtual and physical applause. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the, the panel. Um, we're going to take a...